Oi you, it's time for another episode of Dorothy and the Dealer. Let's tune into the conversation. You, you, you know, you talk about, um, you know, the different levels at the, at the very base, it's the, or the least evolved, it's the black and white thinking. And then as you grow and as you're broad, broader, it's, it's greyer. Uh, or you can see the grey. How do you how do you say that people move through those levels? How well, do you move from the masses to the masters who have it in their heart? Well, when I ask people uh, from a religious the the religious construct, how many of you have gone through and found yourself migrating through religious understanding as you've evolved from your teens, twenties, thirties, forties, and fifties? And most people put their hands up and said they've migrated. Yeah. You have a few that are really stuck and very dogmatic and very staunch, polarized individuals. But mm -hmm. most people, they bang their head against the wall trying to be something and find out that doesn't match. Yeah. Yeah. And they can't, and so they realize they're, they're caught in paradoxes. And eventually they confront those paradoxes and evolve past it. So there is a, a, an evolution of moral development and religious development that's easy to see in most people's lives. Mm -hmm. um, so. That happens in almost every field. Every field that I've studied, 297 different disciplines, I find that same uh, imperative sitting there in the disciplines. So in anthropology, you see it. You have a dogma sitting there, and then you have the, the people out there that are challenging the dogma, and they're more objective. And you got others that are, they'll stay, you know, Darwinian evolution. I mean, Aristotle stood for 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. 2,000 years. Mm -hmm. Anybody that went against Aristotle was considered a, you know, yeah. crazy. Uh, Giordano Bruno faced that. Caper Copernicus, Galileo, they all were challenging Aristotelian, Ptolemaic, geocentric worlds. So what makes someone challenge it and what makes someone stay in that space of black the, and white? The evidence that they accumulate gets so strong. So it's experience? It, it's, it, it, they, they become objective in their data. And they make sure that's as objective as they can, and then they're convinced that there's the data doesn't support that. Yeah. Right. I did that when it came to human psychology. I yeah. found that I didn't find um, this idea of one-sidedness when I did that's that right. research. Yeah. I said that this is this is the opium of the masses. Mm -hmm. yes. This isn't what's true. Yeah. This is what sells. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I realized the commercial element of that. Mm -hmm. Well, because so because there's I mean there's banks and fraternities and organizations that understand that need for people and sell. Particularly to that part well, of what the human design. Market liability means stability to lie to the market. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're having to sell to the fantasy. Yeah. And uh, it sells a lot easier. Yeah. But I, I think if I, I use the analogy, if, if I was to um, if I was to stand up, let's say there's a, a gentleman up on stage and he was speaking to a mass audience and he was saying that, you know, you can get instantly wealthy mm -hmm. for this by this forty nine dollar package and you're going to be instant wealth overnight without effort, instant gratification, a billionaire overnight. Right. Buy this Bitcoin or something. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and um, I'm sure that in that presentation, the people that are neophytes in the area of finance would be sucked into it yeah. because of the dopamine. Yeah. Because they, they're, they're, they bang in their head against the wall and they're not getting ahead and they go, yeah. oh, this will be my way out. A yeah. quick fix. Even Jim Collins warned against immediate gratification and, and one thing to fix everything. Yeah. Buffett would just sit there and just nod his head, like shake his head and just yeah. walk out. Yeah. Because yeah. he would know that that's ridiculous. Yeah. But, but the truth is not in the hands of the masses, yeah. generally. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's in the hearts that's of the masters. Right. Yeah. And everyone has a master inside them, but not all of them are awakening it. So what, I mean, I, I think I, I'm going to know your answer, but what awakens it? What awakens the heart of a master? How, well, do, how do you awaken that? The, the, what I do, and I'm sure you're involved in too, you're, you're helping people see the two sides of an event. And the more the brain sees two sides of an event, the more transcendental it awakens. And the less it sees it, the more it polarizes events, the more it stays trapped in that seeking of one side and avoiding the other side. I think that in us saying that, though, it's, I think it's important to note that it's not just about seeing the two sides, is it? Synchronously. Yes, because you have to, it, like you can see the plus and then you, because a lot of people can see the plus you and have, see the you, minus. You can't separate them in time. Yes. Yeah. They have to be synchronized. Synchronized, yeah. That's why the synchronicity is so important. Yes. Mm. I just finished a program that I, I delivered in South Africa just a few days ago called Synchronicity, where we went decade by decade through people's lives 
and we took an event that was most painful, uh, most rejection, most uh, negative in their minds, and found out where the other side was at mm -hmm. the exact same moment yeah. until it was quantitatively, qualitatively balanced. Yeah. And we found it, what is called episodic memories, which are um, the exact space, the exact time, the content, the context, the vector, who it is, etc. We got narrowed it down and got really precisely present with it. And the intuition just pulls out of the subconscious mind, just pulls out the other side. Yeah. And when they see that other side, there's like a aha. Yeah. There's an awareness that, oh my God, when I was criticized by my dad, I didn't realize it, but I had blocked out with a subjective bias my mom's praise. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And my criticism and praise were synchronous. Yes. And I was actually balanced, and there was nothing but love sitting there. Yes. But I only saw one side, and I ran a story, and I've been avoiding anything that reminds me of that and seeking its opposite as an animal, avoiding pain and seeking pleasure all my life because of that event that I never synchronized. But once I synchronize it, I transcend and awaken and strengthen the transcendent state of the human mind. And then we all of a sudden realize, now I'm able to see things fully from an actualized perspective instead of a subjectively biased state. Yeah. I want to ask you something, um, I think, before we finish up, about um, that moment, that aha moment. And when you experience that moment, you, you're, um, you know, you do that in your, in your seminars. You know, we, we do this in our seminars. But when you experience that moment, something happens. And it's, it's like, um, I, just, I just, my mission for me is to help people understand that there is that place to go to whether they choose to go there or not, but there is a place that they can go to where they can see that it's all synchronized, that there is love in that event or there is uh, love in that moment. But we were listening to you at oh, many, many years ago, Prophecy, I think it was, and you were talking about the science of that and what happens in the cell at oh, that yeah. moment. <clears throat> and I'd love for you to talk a little bit about that, what actually happens when you um, you, you were talking you, you about you want the, to get into the virus thing, yeah right? I just want to get into the how it how it the love and wisdom is is embedded into the cell and then it infects the other cells like a virus uh, can you talk a little bit about that yeah, I think when we were listening to you talking about it it was definitely a, a prophecy I loved which, it. It, it I mean if, if you, you haven't done John's work you're stunting your growth you, you got to do this guy's work it's great but you spoke about how there were good viruses, everybody thought it was only bad viruses. And then they realized, shit, there's actually good viruses. And then you were able to link it and had, a, had a, 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 you know, that equilibration point, that breakthrough, that quantum collapse moment, actually then infects the environment. So for me, what I realized in that moment, I was like, that kind of means I'm, I'm kind of, if I want to make a difference here, I'm obligated to go to my heart. My heart is the access if, for us to actually make a difference here. So it really, that made me think, whoa, well, you know, there's, there's, that's what we're here to do. We're here to do that. Well, <clears throat> I don't know how to develop that very simply, but I have to do it over well, development it. Well, well, uh, Like I said, just dive in. I'll have to go down the rabbit hole a bit. Go down the rabbit hole. <clears throat> um, if you're highly infatuated with something and you perceive it supporting your values more so than challenging it, uh, you fear its loss. Mm -hmm. And if you're highly resentful to something and you perceive more challenge and support to your values, uh, you fear its gain. So the fear of loss of that which you infatuate with, which is prey, which is food, yeah. is the fear of starvation. Mm -hmm. Analogy. Yeah. And the fear of that which you resent coming to you is the fear of predator, fear of being eaten. Yeah. The two most primordial fears, the fear of loss of food and fear of being eaten. Wow. So <clears throat> it's a food chain mechanism in the brain yeah. that's in the amygdala reacting. So the inability to adapt to a changing environment is called distress. And when you're highly polarized in your perspective with a complete subjective bias where things are all positive, no negative, or all negative, no positive, what I call absolutes, yeah. you have the least amount of resilience, least amount of adaptability, and you're more vulnerable to um, being eaten or, or starving. So the person who is living congruently with their highest values and they're having more foresight and they're pursuing challenges that inspire them 
and they're mitigating the risks and they're planning for the positives and the negatives, knowing full well that they're there and balanced, is the person that's resilient and adaptable to change. Now, when a person does that and they live by their high values and they're not living by lower values, which is that primitive animal behavior, uh, the autonomic nervous system from the brain's neurochemistry has transmitters that go to the cell walls and literally equilibrate the expression of the DNA epigenetically. Uh, the parasympathetic side, which is things that support, uh, causes an acetylation, which is basically uh, an oxidation of an over-reduced state. And, a, and a, on the other side, when you have stress and you feel things that challenge your values, distress, challenging your values, you have what is called oxidation and you now have what is called methylation, which is a reduction to oscillate. So what's happening, the autonomic nervous system is trying to redox the cell at the cell level where the building and destroying of the cell is, is normalized. And when that occurs, this is a feedback to our psychology, it goes back to the psychology and brings us tears of inspiration. It gives us chills in our spine and there's an aha as a confirmation feedback, a homeostat, as a confirmation to let you know that you're seeing things in a balanced state, not a polarized state. But if you see things in a polarized state, the epigenetics will create a turning on or turning off the genetic code epigenetically to make sure you create symptoms in the body to let you know as a feedback that you're not seeing things poised. Mm -hmm. You're in poison state. Yes. <clears throat> so at a cell level and at a physiology level, tissue level, and at an organ level, we have feedback mechanisms. There's an intelligence in the universe, a panpsychism, if you will, that is attempting to homeostat human beings because if they're homeostatic, they are most resilient and adaptable to a changing environment and they more were likely to survive. When they do have resilience, the viruses inside the cell, which are involved in lateral or horizontal gene transferring to other, other members of a species to help advance the species, anytime you are resilient and adaptable and you've seen things in a way you literally alter epigenetically the code and regulatory aspects of the genes to make sure that you're adapting and the virus takes in those transpositions and those modifications, epigenetic modifications and different uh, karyotypical uh, expressions and makes sure that that is then taken out and excised out and put in the environment to give other members of our species that advantage that you gleaned in your moment of awareness. Yes, yes, yes. So we're assisting human beings. Every moment of enlightenment leaves its mark and that. assists other members of the species to evolve. How many years have you been running the breakthrough uh, experience? It's been, it's been a been long 29 time. Is, I'm now going on my 30th year. Right. In that program, I, I do the grief process, which I'm working on a book on. And this process, I've done about 3,500 cases now. I started in 1984, and I've been using it clinically all these years. And um, it works. It's just a science. And it's a, there's absolutely no reason why a person has to have grief more than three hours ever again on the planet with this tool. Mm -hmm. But what happens is, is that every trait, action, or inaction that a person perceives is missing, that they're grieving the loss of from a bereavement, are traits that they infatuated with, that they assumed supported their values more than challenged it. Nobody grieves the loss of things that they resent. That they, yeah. Yeah. they only grieve the loss of the things they're infatuated with. Yeah. So the truth is, with every grief, there's a hidden relief. Mm -hmm. They're entangled. But one is conscious, if they're grieving, it's because they're infatuated with these parts mm -hmm. and holding on to the memories of that. Yeah. And the other is buried and unconscious. And my job in the process is to integrate those two. Mm -hmm. When we do, we find out, we go through and we identify what traits, actions, and actions specifically that this person perceives as missing since the passing or the death. And uh, they find out, we list them. On average, it's between 9 and 11 different ones, about 10 for every death on average. Could be up to 26 is the most extreme. At least is about 3 or 4, but usually 10. When we identify, then, who is now emerging around you to display these traits, we realize that the traits are conserved. I just did in my synchronicity program, I, I took people and I had them take a trait within themselves that they display 
and trace it on who they displayed it to all the way back to as, as early as they can remember in their childhood. Mm -hmm. And literally smoothly through time. Yeah. So we are training the autobiographical memory and we're going linear through time and showing how you've never gained or lost a trait. Yeah. And then we're taking that same trait on the outside and we're finding out who displayed it to you and demonstrated it to you and tracing it back person by person between one and many people, male and female, close and distant, through your life. Mm -hmm. And people were blown away by the realization that no trait is ever gained or lost. It's, it's there. It's there. It's totally conserved. Yeah. Now, once it's conserved, we realize that at death, those traits are not gone. <clears throat> so the behavior that the person has is easily demonstrable uh, on some other people that emerge. So I now have a principle that at death, we go from one to many. And at birth, we go from many to one. So it's, it's dispersed, and it can disperse to a great many or a few or even one, but it's there. And once we identify it individually, uh, we realize that it's conserved and there's no loss. So we can see that the animal behavioral traits, the things we like or dislike about the person, we can trace, mm -hmm. like or dislike, we can trace in the mortal, from one mortal to the next, you might say. Yeah. So that is accounted for. There's no loss. Mm -hmm. So we can easily see a form of reincarnation, not of the individual being, but of all the behavioral traits we can see as immediately emerged into and emerges simultaneously at the, be de the passing. I've seen it as it happened, yeah. mm -hmm. right on the spot, yeah. what I call fresh death. Yeah. And um, you've, to you've told us about a couple of experiences. Yeah, we, we had one recently. Mm -hmm. We had one uh, in the training program in Houston where her father, a woman's father, passed. She found out on the cell phone, and we emerged. We got to watch the emergence right there in the room of the people playing the roles. Okay. So once we realize that, uh, and nothing is ever gained and lost, I say that the master lives in a world of transformation. The masses live in the illusions of gain and loss. Once we realize that, uh, the fear of loss, uh, the, 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 the grief is dissolved. The moment the grief and the relief are integrated and we brought the, the things that they were infatuated with and found out who was doing it and the drawbacks of that trait they were infatuated with and the benefits of the new people's trait demonstrations, once those are balanced and equilibrated, the heart opens and they feel grateful and they feel the presence of the person. I always say you can never lose somebody you love. You can only lose the parts of the person that you're infatuated That's with. Right. Mm -hmm. Once you're there in love, now you have access to a transcendental aspect that's duplicatable. I can demonstrate it over and over again uh, to what we could call the immortal part, the part that doesn't die, mm -hmm. that doesn't disappear. And this is something spooky, uh, really spooky to some people for the first time if they've never seen this, where all of a sudden a person who you pick as a surrogate starts to display and demonstrate behaviors and knowledge that the person that passed away had. The most extreme case was a 11-year-old girl who all of a sudden had a palsy with the left hand and started communicating to a 57-year-old woman and said things that this 76-year-old mother only knew mm -hmm. with a palsy in the left hand. Mm -hmm. And behaviors come through that's hard to describe that you, you, you can't explain yeah. easily because they had, there's no way they could have known this yeah. information. So there's, there's the mortal component, the, the imminent mind, as Immanuel Kant described, and the immortal, the transcendent mind uh, that he described that appears to be existing inside the human. Some people, um, it was William James that described it as the higher self and the lower self. Um, it has many names. Mm -hmm. uh, in religious writings, it was, it was uh, given the celestial and the terrestrial. It's got many names, but there's definitely evidence that when you have an equilibrated mind, you access the transcendental, and when you have a non-equilibrated mind, you access the, the mortal, animal, imminent components. Mm -hmm. And that we can identify as an as a incarnating component. Mm -hmm. The other is actually accessible through other individuals, which we, I won't call it incarnation, I'm just going to call it a, the ability to attune and, and express a, another individual that's passed on. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Both of those are accessible, mm -hmm. and we can demonstrate that. And I, I love demonstrating it in front of people, yeah. even skeptics, because they, they go. Yeah. I, I had a gentleman who was a, a, a medical specialist, a professor, uh, who came to the Breakthrough Experience in London, and uh, when I mentioned this, 
he said, you know, you're really stretching my, my, yeah. my, my reality here with this. And then he got picked right. unexpectedly to be the father of a woman who had, he had died. And he was blown away on what he all of a sudden was saying. Mm. And what was interesting is uh, she had a video clip of her father wow. before he died. And she played it the next day. And this neuroscientist said, you just screwed my head up. <laughs> Everything that I've just <laughs> been taught, just tossed out the window now. I don't know what to believe now because I just said that. Yeah. Yeah. I just said those things. And I don't even know where. I'd never say those things. It yeah. just came through me and it did it. Yeah. If you could give us a piece of advice from your life, what would it be? Piece of advice? Mm -hmm. um, well, I, I'm a firm believer in... Uh, finding out what you really value and giving yourself permission to pursue what's truly you right. and not attempt to be a cat trying to swim or a fish trying to climb. Yeah. Allow yourself to be you. The, mo mo the, the most magnificent you will ever be is yourself. And so many have subordinated to the influence of the world around them instead of let the voice and vision guide them from within them. Mm -hmm. And so I'm a firm believer in identifying what you really value and Give yourself permission to prioritize your life accordingly and pursue what's truly meaningful to you and give yourself permission to delegate yes. the rest of it away mm -hmm. and do something that's so meaningful and so productive that it earns the income to pay for the person to delegate. Yes. So serve. I think we're rewarded by serving and by being authentic. Okay, two more questions to finish up. The first one is um, if you um, were to have a message for anyone listening today, what would that be? One message that you'd like to share. I, I think I said it, to give yourself permission to be yourself. Yeah. Cool. And, and um, prioritize your life. You know, I, I, Gary Keller in his book, The One Thing, says a really yeah. nice oh, thing. That's great. Uh, you ask yourself, what is the highest priority action you can do today to help you fulfill the most meaningful and most important thing yeah. of your life? Mm -hmm. yeah. If you do that every moment, and as you complete that, do that again. Yeah. Uh, a very fulfilled and very prioritized life occurs and you maximize your brain and creativity. And I could go on and on on the yeah. significance of doing that. So I've been doing that, the highest priority, seven highest priority action steps every day yeah. for years. Yeah. But the one is even tighter. Yeah. So if you go somewhere, have mm -hmm. the, the few highest priorities, yes. the top three, the top one, or the top yeah. seven. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think is a wise thing to do every day. Did, and did, thank you so much for your time. We really yeah, appreciate John, that. John, thank you. We really <laughs> appreciate that. We really, really appreciate, really, appreciate really, that. Really, really appreciate it, <laughs> yep. Thanks for having fun appreciate with us. Thanks, Thanks for hanging out. Yep. And um, you're off now to check out the venue, see how it all looks. Check out the venue and, and uh, mm. get to do my breakthrough experience. Yeah. And, uh, the next time, 1,000... 29th time now. <laughs> is that really? Awesome. This is the 1,000th, 29th time? Yep. Yeah, wow. that's good.